Welcome to the NDX presentation this evening. It's using encoded technology to improve aesthetics in implant dentistry. Tonight's presentation is being presented by Kelly Bevington, RDA, EFDA, and Tiffany Shrepler, and we'll begin shortly. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce both Kelly Bevington and Tiffany Shrepler. Kelly Bevington is an RDA, EFDA, and the Director of Interoral Technology here at National Dentex. Kelly began her career more than 20 years ago as an RDA EFDA graduating from Bryman College. She has a comprehensive knowledge of dentistry and the dental laboratory industry. Kelly has been professionally trained on most major devices, and she is able to provide expert chairside coaching. She manages the NDX clinical iOS training team and has clinically trained over a thousand dentists and their teams. Kelly enjoys sharing her knowledge by presenting webinars and is a regular contributor to dental publications. Tiffany Shrepler is the product manager in digital for ZimV. Tiffany is the, is the North American product manager for the entire digital portfolio at ZimV Dental. She embraces lab workflows, full arch restoration solutions, and increasing practice productivity through technical support. Tiffany loves the direction dentistry is headed and enjoys helping to educate on how digital dentistry can benefit all dental practices. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, ladies. Awesome. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction, Jessica. You are appreciated. So as she stated, we are going to go through today uh, some really valuable information. I think everyone will walk away with a tidbit or a pearl that they can utilize in their practice moving forward. So with that being stated, using encoded technology to improve aesthetics in implant dentistry. Uh, implant dentistry is one of those areas that uh, either people are exceptionally comfortable or maybe they're just getting into the um, expo having some um, entry level exposure to it, but it certainly is something not to be afraid of and technology can support us throughout this journey. So with that being stated, I am going to progress here. And um, we do have to give a disclosure. So I am employed by ZimV Dental and I'll let Kelly introduce herself as well. And, and I am uh, Kelly Bevington and I am employed by National Dentex. Wonderful. So with that being stated, we're gonna roll into our program. Go ahead, Kelly. Thanks so much, Tiff. So I'm... Uh, Excited to share with you that we have an iOS training team here at NDX, something quite unique in the dental laboratory industry. And what we do is we provide support to our customers and potential prospects on how to use their intraoral scanners for something that perhaps they're not familiar with. Um, it, implants, uh, for example. So we have a team across the country supporting the East Coast, Midwest, and West. This is um, us on the screen. And what I'm most excited about is that we're all clinical people. So I'm I'm an RDA EFTA by original training. Brittany is in the West Coast and she is a dental hygienist. And then Brenda is supporting the Midwest and she's an RDA CDA. Jessica already did a wonderful job introducing myself, so I'm not going to bore you too, too much. But uh, with a webinar, I do like to try to engage with people and have a little bit of fun, right? So so who are these faces on the screen? Um, I've had a unique pleasure of sort of living across the country. I'm from uh, Pennsylvania, where I reside now, but I started in dentistry in Southern California. Uh, my husband was in the Marine Corps, which took us there and worked for an amazing Navy dentist that had an in-house lab. We did denture work on site, then moved across country to Connecticut, where I worked for an amazing AACD dentist, um, experienced, you know, feldspathic veneers on site again. It was interesting when I moved back to Pittsburgh um, and, and was working in another dental practice and they had an in-house lab. And for me, I thought all dentists had in-house labs. Like I didn't realize that was very unusual. So um, it makes sense that I ended up working for a dental laboratory. 
And uh, a fun fact about me, my husband and I are celebrating 40 years of marriage. We were next door neighbors, our anniversaries in September. And we recently became empty nesters, my daughter and her, and my um my son-in-law, that sounds so strange to say that, they just got married in the fall, uh, got married in our backyard. It was a post-COVID thing, and it worked out amazing. Um, and then our Empty Nest project is our Greater Swiss Mountain Dog, uh, Walter, and doing different uh, exciting adventures with him. And I just love D dentistry in general, but I love digital. And I was uh, in a hotel a couple years ago and everybody was wearing, I love digital buttons. And it was for um, digital keys, right? Uh, from our phone to allow us into our rooms. I thought, oh, I want one of those buttons. So I, I love it. I love digital. It's a great place to be in dentistry. And it's a, it's a reason for me to smile for sure. So um, one of the things that, that I like to do is to share that knowledge, right? So we have created an intraoral scanning um, tips and tricks sheet that was sent to you as part of your handouts. And then, you know, keep your eyes open for different podcasts and um, articles moving forward. Thanks so much, Tiff. Oh, for sure. So um, my name is Tiffany Shrepler, and um, I am the North American product manager for Zimvi Dental. Um, I've been in dental since the early 2000s and actually had spent some time with the NDX group um, and really enjoy what they do, how they educate. So was very excited to be able to work with them today to on this educational opportunity. So I started with Zimvi as what's called a digital dentistry sales specialist and then became one of the leads on that team, and then ultimately um, elected to get into marketing and become a product manager. As you can imagine, uh, there's a lot to talk about with digital dentistry. Um, it's consistently changing and growing and evolving. Um, and for somebody who gets bored with monotony, it, it keeps me on my toes and keeps me learning, which I love. So I just actually recently completed an MBA at LSUS. Um, and uh, was very grateful that um, I had the opportunity to do that. So you can see a picture. Those are my kids with some of my swag, because of course, uh, part of my personality too is uh, to do things to the best of our ability, right? Uh, we owe that to ourselves. And, and I know that the doctors I've worked with throughout the years really feel that towards their patients. How do we really accomplish our goals and make sure that we do the very best for the people that we're treating. Um, I'm a mother of three. My husband's an electrical engineer. So um, there's not much that can be said to me when people say, I want to do something once and correctly. Uh, I don't know if you know many electrical engineers, but they are cut from a very different cloth <laughs> uh, and clearly um, one that I appreciate. And then um, just a little brag on, on my little guys. I have uh, two sons that just competed in Odyssey of the Mind. Um, it's a world competition that's sponsored by NASA, and they got sixth in the world. Um, they created a structure out of balsa wood that held over 600 pounds. So with that being stated, uh, we're very proud of our additional future engineers in our family. Um, so with that being stated and um, kind of our intros underway, um, I'm going to progress a little bit about ZimV. Um, most of you know that it's um, we're a worldwide leader in comprehensive tooth replacement and rehabilitation solutions. So we know implants quite well. Um, and this is the team at ZimV that supports all of the efforts. So I think it speaks volumes as we're talking about a topic that can be slightly intimidating to some or folks that are new to digital. Um, it means something when you have organizations understand not only the importance, but continue to support. Uh, with that being stated, digital dentistry, so many parts and pieces. It's definitely going um, to continue to grow, and it's an exciting thing to be part of. Let's see here if we can. Okay, so. All right. So what we used to do and how we used to collect information, it's rapidly changing and we don't have to be scared of it. We have the opportunity to continue to advance. Um, it's very easy to see that we kind of have a little bit of um, support with our, our efforts when we talk dental now. So with that being stated, we have to make sure that we stay abreast of all these different changes and tools 
that we have. So goals of digital dentistry, all these things are so important, but the most important thing is truly to improve the patient experience, right? Which is what digital dentistry offers. So it's very exciting. Um, it's also, as we stated, something that has a little bit of a learning curve. And so we're here to help support that. With that being stated, when we talk digital with implant dentistry specifically, um, there's a huge push to understanding how important the right parts and pieces are as we're going to restore these cases. So there's a process behind how to restore, but there's also a way to do things that give better percentages, better um, chances of these different restorations succeeding and, and accomplishing our goals for our patients. So one of the things that's important is when we talk about OEM, original equipment manufacturing, and I will say that for any company that you're working with, um, if all their studies and all their white papers are based around their products, it's strongly advised to make sure that you're using the appropriate parts and pieces. Because if not, we can come into situations where clone products are utilized it can create issues and man, it is not a good day in any dental office when we have these type of issues, right? So micro motion is one of the top concerns when we go to restore a dental implant. We do not want that implant moving, right? We want to place it, we want it to properly heal. And we also then want to restore it with the best solution for the patient at hand. So in conclusion to that, we know that with specific restorations, the abutment material and the manufacturer of the abutment being utilized really has to come into play. It has to be part of the consideration because we can do everything right on the front end, right? We can do an excellent job placing the implant. We can go in and allow the patient to properly heal. But if we don't restore the case correctly and utilize a reputable laboratory to help with that, we can really find ourselves in a pickle. So as we state that, the other part that we always have to remember is that we, the micro motion is so important, but it also, the reason why it's so important is it, it can lead to screw loosening. So when I go in and I go chair side, um, one of the concerns that we frequently have is, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. The, the abutment's loose. Well, a lot of that can be traced back to how it was restored, what parts were utilized. So this is something we want to try to avoid with implant dentistry. Now, the history of implant restorations, Man, we've come a long way, right? I mean, if we look at some of the different ways we used to, to restore implants, it, some of these kind of look like medieval torture devices. Um, I, I guess I aged myself. I was doing a, a training seminar recently and someone was like, well, I don't even know what some of those things are. I'm like, well, you're lucky <laughs> because that means that you probably didn't have to experience any of them being placed. Um, but with that being said, um, all joking aside, they serve their purpose, but we, we know that our industry just continues to improve. Um, so the way we restore things has improved as well. Um, so as we go to collect for data for our, our impressions, there's six elements we truly think of at the implant level, right? Is our sub G, which is our implant location in space, implant restoration connection, and our emergence profile, right? We want something that looks natural and beautiful. And our super G is our marginal configuration. Relationship with adjacent teeth and implants is very important. And then our interarch space and relationship. So these are all things that we have to consider as we're going into these cases. With that, um, we also know that we need to really kind of explain to our patients and, and to, into our, our staff, et cetera, you know, the difference between some of these solutions, because for a very long time, stock components, that was how things were restored, right? And that was okay. And people were happy with that. But custom abutments are changing the game for the industry as a whole. And you can see here that regardless of what your personal opinion is, if you look at these two different bridges, right? Three unit bridges, um, you know, we can see that our custom abutment truly allows for a very patient specific solution. It's gonna give you a better foundation. So when that patient bites, we're going to have a much more stable environment for our implants than some of those stock components that have been out there. And stock was back in the day, really our, our only option, right? But we know they're cylindrical. We know that there's require a lot of preparation. Um, there's no real uh, availability to customize these products. So the teeth aren't round. And so this is not no longer 
uh, something that our patients get real excited about. Uh, usually the aesthetics aren't quite what we're looking for. And again, as we are always striving for that best solution for the patient, there, there's a better option out there. So custom abutments, we have to also talk about some of the options that are out there from a restorative standpoint. And UCLA's were huge with implants for a very long time. They were truly the first custom abutment that were out there. But we know with UCLA abutments, it's very, very time consuming at the lab level, right? It takes a lot of time to, to really go through the process to um, you know, essentially form the wax and then cast. So um, a lot of laboratories are kind of shying away from this because of that labor. And of course, we know that along with the long times working on things is a cost associated with it. So with all that being stated, it supports that CAD CAMs are future, right? Digital technology on so many levels. And we're going to get into intraoral scanning and, and what it can do for a practice and how it can help support efforts. But it's pretty amazing to see where we're at, right? This is the future, and, and it's truly the present as well. We have a chance now to access information and collect information in a manner that allows us to treat patients much differently than, than we previously could. So clinical benefits of anything when we discuss CAD CAM technology, ideal anatomic contours, correct emergence profile, proper margin placement, angle correction, and a proper restorative support. So this I think is very interesting because I often hear from people, well, I mean, an abutment's an abutment. Well, when we talk about the fact that we are already dealing with many times folks that are getting implant therapy, not all times, but many situations where they're having a hard time from a hygiene perspective, right? Um, they, they, they really truly are in a situation where anything we can do to help them care for themselves is going to be needed, right? Because we want to make sure that these implants last and that our patients are taken care of. So this stock abutment, you can see how much space the coping and the actual crown is doing to create the emergence profile. Whereas if you design, properly design and fabricate a custom abutment, we just have a much better foundation for the implant and for the crown as well. Um, this is going to be much easier to care for for the patients and overall provide a much more aesthetic solution. So I always joke around because I show my kids my presentation and I was like, well, which one of these would you want? And they're like, oh my gosh, mom, that's not even a question. I'm like, all right. Okay. So, so I just want to make sure I'm getting my point that this is a, this is a really great thing to do and uh, custom abutments truly can change the game. Um, this also is just demonstrating that with the proper design of an abutment, um, we can avoid some of the food traps, again, making it much easier for patients to care for themselves. So something made just for you is going to look like you, right? These are going to look beautiful. And, and that's really what it comes down to our phenomenal end results. I am so excited when I go into specific cases and you have to really look to see which, which is the tooth that's been working on. I think that that's when we're winning is when it's that natural. So whatever uh, leaves an impression is the journey. Um, this is kind of funny. I wouldn't want to get on this bridge. We want something that's solid. We want to have solutions that we can count on that are precise. Um, and that's the, the golden question is, how do you get there? How do we get there? Um, and the answer is, is that there's a couple different ways to get there with implant dentistry um, in, in this year. Um, and one of the things I always like to talk about are some of the different options that are out there, regardless of who you're working with. Um, you know, you're going to have a couple workflows that are available. Um, you can send in a PBS impression, and then the um, it can be CAD designed, computer aided designed by and milled by an implant manufacturer. Um, you can do PBS impressions and um, then create a stone model by the doctor and lab, have the lab design it and have it milled by the implant manufacturer, right? These are different solutions and options available for abutments. Intraoral scan and sent directly to the implant manufacturer, right? We can take away the entire process of having to pour the model because we can send it direct to a lab. Um, and then intraoral scan designed by the lab and sent to an implant manufacturer. So there's a couple different solutions here that are available, um, which is exciting because no one loves this. This is our conventional painful process, right? Um, I actually went into an office that I was helping last week Oh my goodness. Um, it was one of the first times I had to do a closed tray impression in a very, very long time. 
Um, and I just kept thinking, oh my goodness, there's an easier way to do it, you know? Um, but this is what we had to work with and it did work, right? Is there a better way to do it, do this? That that's that's your decision. Um, but I have a couple of ideas and different ways to do it. And it really does involve digital, right? Um, with the utilization of a scanner and a scan body, the processes we just reviewed for abutment design and fabrication can be accomplished quite easily. And then we pop a crown on the abutment and, and we call it a day, which is really exciting. Um, and we know we have tons of options out there for scanners. There are awesome scanners out there that um, I always say for anybody who, you know, is asking or inquiring, it's so good to go and get your hands on the scanners, try them out. Kelly's going to get into this, so I don't want to steal her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's remarkable. Um, so that's what this program really is about. And, and and we're so excited to continue to give each and every one of you that would like the opportunity to kind of check out what's out there. Um, what does your, where does your scan body come from? I put this on here because it's so important. I frequently have offices say, well, this particular lab sent me a scan body. And the only thing I'd like to caution is remember that where your scan body comes from is typically going to determine where your abutment comes from as well. So those are just, that's an, a thing to remind yourself of and understand that when um, particular companies send the scan body, it does usually impact where the case goes. So we're going to make this um, as painless as possible, I promise, but we're going to go through a custom abutment workflow in an analog world versus a digital world, okay? So our step one in implant dentistry is we have to remove the healing abutment. So whatever's covering that implant, right, has to be removed because we need access to the implant itself. So if we're going in an analog uh, workflow, we're going to attach the transfers to the implant. So these are the copings that allow us to really determine angulation and where that implant is sitting within the patient's mouth. If we look at the digital side, we skip this step. We're gonna use a, a custom tray in the analog workflow and prepare holes that will line up with the transfers when the impression is taken, block out the holes on top of the screws with wax or another suitable material. So again, this takes time and preparation. For digital workflow, we skip this. We're gonna block out the holes on the top of the screws with wax um, and just um, confirm and make sure that we are prepared. Everything's blocked appropriately. Place light to medium body impression material around the transfers and record our impression, right? Make sure those screws are protruding correctly. Um, with the tray still in place, unscrew and remove the retaining screws. Again, we've skipped all these steps with our digital workflow. Remove the impression tray, connect the implant replicas to the transfers. I mean, you guys get the point. Most of us on the call, I'm certain, have done this process. It takes time, right? We're sending it to the lab now. The lab's going to have to disinfect, pour up a stone model, trim the model. And now we're on step 15 in the analog world. And step two is we're placing a scan body into a patient's mouth for our digital workflow. So one of the things I like to remind everybody is it's not about 15 steps versus two. It's about the fact that every step of those 15 steps opens up a margin of error. Every time a human hand touches this case, or we go to pour a model, or we don't properly clean out the bowl before we mix the stone, there's a chance for this case to have an issue. And with digital dentistry, the coolest part of intraoral scanning is the fact that a lot of that is minimized. I will not say it goes away completely because that's not, that's not fair, but it is minimized. So with that being stated, the thing that I also like to bring up for this slide is what, what happens at slide 16? Slide 16 here, or step 16, even if you're going analog, meaning you send in a PVS impression, we're pouring up a model and we're going to digitize it, right? Versus three, doing an intraoral scan directly in your patient's mouth. So for people who are very concerned about the accuracy of scanning, one of the things I like to remind them is even if you are not utilizing and benefiting from intraoral scanning today, there's a chance your lab is probably digitizing the case as soon as they can. So just keep that in mind because the technologies here, and as anybody who has some doubts about, about all things life and likes to experiment and explore before they invest, this, this is definitely a way to, to win, right? So with that being stated, step four, we're replacing a healing abutment. 
Uh, step 17, the lab has to design it or five, right? Doctor can click and send it directly to um, whomever they wish to fabricate the actual abutment. You design the crown and abutment together. Um, they create a die now that's going to be in the shape of the abutment. So all of this is pretty easy and seamless. Um, and then the question is, but is this the even the only way, right? Is this a, is there even a better way than this? And that's when an impression coping will, will lead to an abutment. And that's great. Then we have scanners, right? A, a scanner teamed with a scan body will create an abutment. That's better. But at the end of the day, there is technology, it's encoded technology that will allow through the utilization of occlusal surface codes, you can place this product in a patient's mouth at time of surgery. And what it will do is it'll serve as your, your healing abutment, it'll cover the implant, which is needed to heal. The design of it will actually allow for the tissue to be contoured in the appropriate manner. Um, and it can be utilized both to scan or as a impression coping would be for in PBS impression. So is that the best? It's great. And it accomplishes three different solutions in one, um, but there is even a better way. So um, we're going to get into what that way is, but let's just go into just a couple of little stats here, which is, you know, we went over the, what, what encoded technology can offer a three in one healing abutment hard and soft tissue preservation with reduced abutment swaps or component swaps. Because once the implant is covered, the next time that that encode comes out of a patient's mouth is actually to place your restoration. So you don't have to take these tiny pieces in and out of the mouth that you would in a traditional environment. It's available for many different product lines. It reduces chair time. Many implants have been restored and it is a, a great product. So what could be improved? Well, let me tell you, there were things that needed to be improved. The um, emergence profile has changed on the product. So you can see there's a one millimeter emergence profile before it actually scallops out. Um, pink matte appearance is, makes it much easier to scan. Um, intuitive codes, and then this can be utilized at tissue level now, which in the past you needed it to actually raise above the gingiva. Now it can be at tissue level, which allows for a nice solution for our anterior cases. So how, how to maintain tissue, um, a healthy intact mucosa is essential for teeth and oral health. Um, clinical relevance, um, we know that multiple abutment swaps can create some problems for patients, discomfort, et cetera, um, reduces that through this product offering and an aesthetic outcome, which is great. Lots of solutions for heights, very easy to take in and out of the patient's mouth. You just need a, a simple driver. Um, sorry, um, new intuitive codes so that you can see here, just the, the occlusal surface codes here can determine and tell our implant connection, abutment type, hex orientation and implant diameter. So these are available for many different SKUs and products, platforms, you name it. Um, it we, you know, frequently there's questions on determining what is going to, to be the best solution out there. You have lots of options for this. Um, so the main workflow is it can be scanned or impressed, but it shines the brightest when it's scanned. Um, you can have an ENCODE empowered laboratory design and have the laboratory submit to the milling center for it to be milled. Um, and you can get a beautiful CAD CAM solution. Um, so with that being stated, we can actually skip through this a little bit because um, that the video is a little longer, but um, it does walk through. So if anybody's interested, please reach out and I will share this video as well, uh, the process of how the ENCODE is decoded. Um, so restoring clinician sends to the lab and uh, essentially the laboratory will de design an abutment that is fabricated by the, the manufacturer. So I am now going to hand this over to Kelly. Thanks so much, Tiffany. We okay. did have a question that came up that I'd like um, to address. It's how do you judge the integration of the implant if you were not removing the healing abutment until you were placing the final restoration? Sure, sure. So are we thinking, um, I think what that means is we want to do something um, maybe with an Austell or something where we're determining integration. You can certainly take the ENCODE out if, if you would like to for that. That is, you know, that's not a problem. 
Um, a majority of the time, what we've we notice and what our customers are doing and, and, and doctors are doing is ENCODE is placed at time of surgery. And then we do an X-ray um, prior to restoring the actual, you know, before we scan, we would do an X-ray just to ensure we like where everything's sitting. We like where our bone is at, where the tissue is at. And then from there, um, you know, we will then take an intraoral scan or PBS impression, but typically a scan, um, and then send that over to the laboratory prior to fabricating the restoration. But you can remove the ENCODE. It just seems as though a majority of our customers do not remove it until time of rest restorative appointment. Got it. Great question. Good, thank you. Um, so along that, I, I have a question with specific to the ENCODE emergence product. So with, with typical scan bodies that we're using, um, wherever the key identifier is on the scan body, if there's multiple units, we make the recommendation before scanning to alternate them. So the key identifier would be facing, facing buccally, then lingually, then buccally, then lingually, if they're all the same, because the scanner sees it as a consistent part. Do you find the same thing with the ENCODE or not because it's ENCODED? Well, it's a great question. And I'll tell you what, so with this product, um, first and foremost, I'd like to bring up since we're talking scan bodies. Yeah. With a scan body, you typically it results in two scans, right? Because yeah. we're going to remove, we're going to remove and we're going to do a tissue scan. And then we are going to place our scan body and then we're going to actually scan with the uh, scan body in place. So it's a two scan process for a majority of scan bodies. Yes. With the ENCODE and the technology associated with it. What you will want to do is just ensure that the, the x-ray is taken and that the ENCODE's fully seated. Yep. But once it's fully seated, when you go to scan, what happens is all of that information is imported or it's sent to a laboratory that is equipped with a software library. And that library allows access just based upon the occlusal surface to decode and tell us everything that's going on underneath. Yeah, that, so, that's the part that's like blows my mind. It's so amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it absolutely. Really, it really is. I just, I needed to just, you know, state that for edification, right? Sure. Um, so, whoop, sorry about that. Let's go back a second. So scanning implants. So typically when you are scanning an implant, the laboratory needs to know the implant manufacturer, the scan body type, the platform size, and then what type of abutment do you want? Do you want a custom abutment? Um, and what type of crown material do you want? Not only that, but then do you want it to be cement retained or screw retained? And there's some philosophical differences in that. And, and I've seen changes over the last couple decades where, you know, screw retained was very popular and then it became all cement retained. And now we're back to screw retained being uh, prescribed more frequently, I would say. And this is an example of the x-ray that we mentioned, right? So this would be on a, not an ENCODE, um, a traditional scan body that we have seen in the past. And this can really roll into a lot of uh, concerns and problems. So it first occurred to me or first experienced with me, it was a pressure sensitive scan body that we were placing. And we thought that it snapped into place. Uh, we were in a university setting. They took an x-ray and we could see a, a considerable gap that it was not completely seated. So we readdressed it, re-snapped it into place and uh, took another radiograph. And certainly then it was confirmed that it was seated. But in most offices, office settings, that would not have occurred. They would have thought that it was in place. And what I found to be interesting was in preparing for some different um, educational presentations, I reached out to customers, good, good customer, good dentist, um, and asked them uh, if they could share a radiograph with me 
of scam bodies in place. And 80% of them were not taking radiographs of their scam bodies in place. Like they didn't really realize it was a thing to do and what concerns could be occurring um, from, from not doing that. So it's important to, um, to, to take a radiograph of the scan body in place. It's important with non-ENCODE scan bodies to alternate uh, the, the scan bodies if there are multiple um, restorations to be prescribed. And typically you're never able to take a bite registration with a scan body in place. The occlusal height of the scan body is going to be too high to allow the patient to, um, to occlude. And as Tiffany mentioned earlier, anytime you're scanning, there's also an additional step involved. Um, usually it's a pretreatment scan, but it's a gingival scan. And that is what's providing to the laboratory the, 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 the tissue uh, representation so that when we go to design it, we're going to be able to provide a beautiful emergence profile in that design. And so where that leads to me is the fact that uh, really ENCODE is your, I'm not advancing here, is it, it, it is, the, you know, for all intents and purposes, I don't want to say the best, right? But um, it hits all those marks perfectly, right? It It is the um, healing abutment. It is the scan body. You have a reduced potential error from having to remove a scan body or place the scan body in uh, to get the gingival tissue scan, as well as um, confirming with a radiograph. And just to review the, the steps again, right, um, you're going to scan the not only the ENCODE, but also the opposing and still taking a bite registration. And then we talked a little bit about a cement retained crown versus a screw retained crown. And the fact that as a laboratory, we support really all the scanners that are out there. And there's new ones coming out on the market routinely, right? A little too frequently for my liking because we're, we're, it's it's our job to support them. Um, but literally, we receive uh, thousands of scans every day, not, not just implant scans, but uh, know that we are equipped to handle and manage those. And I wanted to provide just an example of uh, what a prescription might look like on a scanner as well as the ENCODE in place. So some of the scanners will be very specific in allowing you to identify ZIMV as the implant manufacturer um, and then ENCODE as the, um, the scan body. And so this is a scan of the ENCODE in place, right? And that's on a type of And then, Oppositely, for um, TRIOS, you are going to select it as though it was a prep tooth. So in cases like that, in, and you could look at it as additional simplicity, but it's communication that's really important in that every intraoral scanner on the RX has a note section. And during, you know, in that note section, it's important to communicate to your laboratory what's going on, right? So if you don't see your particular implant or scan body listed in the drop down, please make sure that you're identifying that in your note section for the lab. Now with ENCODE, it's 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 going to be self-apparent. Um, to the laboratory because we are an ENCODE empowered lab group and we're, it's going to become decoded. 
So first and foremost, I just want everyone on the call to understand that um, we've all been new at something or we've all wanted to grow in specific areas of our life. I can assure you going back to graduate school 17 years after graduating with an undergraduate degree was intimidating. Um, but I can promise you that there are so many people that are here to support you as you venture into digital dentistry. And maybe you're starting your journey or maybe you're just looking to amplify it or elevate it. So please make sure you utilize the resources that are out there because there are people and our companies understand the need for the support. That's why Kelly and I are here tonight. Um, and we want to be here. So you're not alone in, in learning. Um, and you're certainly there's, we're not going to shy away from supporting any efforts or needs. So um, I am um, on the flyer, my information's provided. Um, please reach out, let us know what we can do to help you. And ENCODE is a game changer. I mean, this is a way that you can absolutely streamline a workflow, you can simplify, and you can have less inventory. Um, so just take those things into consideration. And if we can help, please let us know. And uh, thanks for your time. And I'll turn it to Kelly. Thanks, Tiffany. We did have a question, and that was in regards to the link you mentioned about how the decoding of the ENCODE works. Um, how how best would people uh, obtain that information? Sure, sure. No, I can walk through it really quickly, and then um, you can certainly reach out to me directly as well. Um, but yeah, so when we talk about decoding the ENCODE, um, the, the NDX lab network, the group, right, they're what's called an, an they're called an ENCODE empowered group. So um, any, any um, laboratory that can decode our technology, um, they're, they're very trained. Um, they have specific libraries in order to do that. And their designers are, they work very closely with us on our products, how to properly design abutments. And then ultimately um, they send them to us for us to fabricate and we send it back to the laboratory for a crown to be placed. So this process is certainly, um, it's not complicated, but it takes a lot of skill. So, I mean, we're talking about a very skilled group of dental technicians that are decoding. Um, and those are, those are NDX employees. Um, so we certainly, um, that's the process. Thank you for that. And then there's a question in regards to um, how best do the general practitioners communicate to the surgeon mm -hmm. about asking for an ENCODE? Sure, sure. I mean, it's a very great question. So essentially any implant that ZimV produces from um, a Zimmer or Biomet, right? Because there's two different lines um, of those, a majority of those have an ENCODE that will fit, fit the actual implant. So what you would simply do is if you're working with either of those lines, you would just go to your surgeon and state, you know, I am interested in the utilization of ENCODE. Um, a lot of our surgeons are using the product. And if they are not, um, you know, having that conversation as a referral to, to a surgeon, um, sometimes they just need to hear that it's, it's desired, right? It's something that, that the, um, the market's asking for. Um, and then we can work directly with the surgeon to get the ENCODE, or we even have GPs that are so involved in the technology that, that they'll purchase the ENCODE. Um, just so you're aware, you know, um, it's, it's a very reasonable um, thing because you're really, it's taking the, the place of the healing collar, the impression coping or scan body, et cetera. So it's, it, it equates in a way that's very beneficial to everybody. Got it. Got it. And then there's an anonymous uh, question here uh, stating that they thought ENCODE was only for anterior teeth. So are they also for posterior and is there a strength concern or is there something new to the, the latest emergence ENCODE for that? It's a great question. So actually in the past, historically, ENCODE was more used in the posterior because the legacy ENCODE required a two millimeter lip or, or um, it would have to be two millimeters above the gingiva to capture the impression. But with the new emergence, it can be at tissue level. So it actually now has opened us up to be able to um, be utilized in the anterior region because you can place an ENCODE at time of surgery, allow it to be tissue level. You can still utilize an Essex retainer or a flipper, and you don't have to worry about that lip, right? Because it doesn't have to protrude from the gingiva. 
And I imagine from an, an aesthetic perspective, it does a superior job then of sculpting the gingival tissue for that final restoration. Yes. Absolutely, Kelly. And and if there's ever a place we really want to get it right, it's the anterior. Yeah. We want that to be beautifully done. So yes, that's a great point. And absolutely, it'll sculpt the, the tissue beautifully. Excellent. It looks like that is it. Speak now or forever hold your peace. No. <laughs> well, Kelly, for you, any closing remarks? My closing remarks are thank you. I mean, really from the bottom of my heart, I say this routinely with webinars, but life is so busy both professionally and personally. And the fact that um, you chose to spend an hour of your time this evening with us to learn something new about dentistry really means the world to us. It really does. Um, I know that there will be post surveys asking about um, additional information that you're interested in learning about. And, and we really, really take that to heart uh, and, and plan future events from that. And um, it was a wonderful collaboration with Tiffany and the folks at ZimV to, to put this together. It's a product line that is important to NDX. Uh, and and we, we really um, honor that partnership and relationship, Tiffany. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and again, we look forward to seeing you next week uh, or the following <laughs> or sometime else this summer. Um, but we truly appreciate your support and attendance for all our educational collaboration initiatives because we want you to take care, take care of those patients and show us how we can take care of you in that survey Kelly mentioned. And with that, I get to bid you all adieu. Have a great night. Awesome. Good night. Take care. Smile away. <laughs>